Well, good evening. Thank you for coming on this wet Thursday night. Maybe I'll step a little bit more to the left here. Um, so I'm going to tell you about printing flexible circuits, uh, but I thought I'd start with this nice image, oh, a little feedback here, of the Gutenberg press, which was invented in Germany in the mid-15th century. And as you likely know, uh, the Gutenberg printing press had a profound impact on European culture because it enabled the proliferation of, of books. Books could be, were more accessible to the general population, and ultimately it allowed the invention of newspapers and what we came to know as the free press. In the 600 years since the Gutenberg press was invented, printing, as you've just heard in Mike McAlpine's talk, has become a very advanced uh, technology. And we are, um, uh, we, we're surrounded by, by printed objects and it, it enriches our lives in many ways. I have a couple of props here. This is a, a printed shopping bag. You can see that it has all kinds of lovely um, Chinese characters on it and some flowers and trees and so on. Um, and then I have two magazines here. One is National Geographic, which is known to use a, a printing process called gravure printing to produce very high quality, um, high resolution, very colorful images. And then I have the shopping uh, catalog the, that, that we all get delivered to our homes probably a couple times a week. And you know the images are, are fantastic, and you're pretty sure that what you uh, order from this mail order catalog is, is what you're actually looking at here. The, what you see is what you get. So um, we are surrounded by, uh, and our lives are enriched by printing technology. Um, but what you might not have appreciated is that printing technology has um, moved into other areas of manufacturing. And for example, if you go to the tile shop and you're interested in buying tile for your kitchen or your uh, bathroom, it's, it's likely that the designs that you see have been inkjet printed in large, um, large printers that are designed to take um, slabs of tile and print on them with hundreds of nozzles, maybe thousands of nozzles. The ink is then fired and set into the ceramic. Um, and so this, this idea that printing um, can be used in other areas of manufacturing has caused us and many other groups around the world to ask, well, can we print electronic circuits? And so the idea, is to come up with uh, electronic inks. In fact, there are commercially available electronic inks made of small bits of semiconductor insulators and metals. Uh, and then we're going to load these inks into printers like inkjet or gravure printers or flexographic printers and produce circuits on, uh, on, on plastic or paper substrates in a continuous roll-to-roll -roll process, much like a photographic film uh, used to be made. And the motivation for doing this is to produce flexible circuits, which enable a variety of interesting applications. For example, unbreakable displays, maybe new motifs for lighting, uh, wearable sensors, maybe flexible solar cells that could be integrated into backpacks or tents and so on. And one that I like very much are wearable, wearable circuits, for example, for the diagnosis of disease. This is a very cumbersome way to record brain waves um, off the surface of the head if you had something that was much more wearable and light and connected wirelessly to a computer um, that could be used for uh, diagnosing uh, sleep disorders, for example. Um, so these are the applications that inspire this field of printed electronics. But there's another advantage to printing, and that is it is potentially greener. Printing, as you've heard, is an additive manufacturing technique. If I want to write two metal lines on a piece of plastic, I just simply write them where I want. But if I um, do uh, conventional processing, conventional processing is subtractive, okay? So that means I put the metal everywhere and then I use etching techniques to remove 95% of the, of the metal on the substrate. And so when you're talking about patterning over large areas, that amounts to a lot of waste. So additive uh, is greener because it produces less waste. So in my mind, the big picture for doing printed electronics um, is that we are combining additive manufacturing with roll-to-roll -roll processing to achieve lower cost per unit area. But it's not just about cost, it's also about having new flexible form factors for electronics. 
Okay, so now I want to switch to thinking about what are the challenges and what are we doing at the university to address some of these challenges. One is we need better inks. So we need electronic inks, metal, semiconducting, and insulating inks. Fortunately, there's been a lot of progress in the last 10 years. We have various kinds of uh, metallic and conducting polymer inks that we can, we can buy. Uh, you can even load these into pens and draw very simple circuits for demonstration purposes. But to really make circuits, we're going to need some very high performance inks. And again, they've got to be made of different classes of materials. So that's the one big issue. I want to focus, though, on the processing side or the printing side. And here I think we have two big challenges, and that's what my group is focused on. Um, one is resolution. So conventional printing presses can make feature sizes that are 50 to 100 microns in size. So that's you know, smaller than your eye can see, and that works well for newsprint. Um, but for electronics, we need sort of one micron feature sizes. So this is a plot of feature size versus printing speed. We want printers up here that work at high rates but can also produce very small features, okay? That's one challenge. The second challenge, and I think this is really um, the, the biggest challenge, is ink registration. Those of you who are in the audience who are about my age or older, you might remember when the Sunday paper would come to your house and you'd look at the comics and if the red and blue ink had been off, offset from each other, you know, your favorite comic was kind of hard to read because it was all blurred out and doubled. That's what we're talking about here, except that the precision we need is much, much higher. If we're running a continuous process where we're printing metallic, semiconducting, and insulating inks, we're trying to build up layered structures that might look like this. It doesn't matter what the device actually does. You just can appreciate we want something that looks like that. If we're uh, misaligned, uh, then the device simply isn't going to work. Right? And the precision we need is, is very high because these dimensions might be a few microns. So, and we want to do this fast. So on a moving substrate that's inherently deformable, that's a major engineering challenge. So um, my colleague in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science, Lorraine Francis, and I have been thinking about this a lot. We had a really excellent student, and together we came up with a, an idea for this problem that's now patented. We call this solution self-aligned capillarity-assisted lithography for electronics, or just, that's a mouthful. Let's call it the scale process. And the idea um, is that we're going to take a, a plastic substrate, and we're going to imprint it, or, or emboss it, with reservoirs, capillary channels, and device cavities, okay? We're going to put complex topography into that, and that's shown here. Reservoirs and a capillary channel, and what's not shown is a device cavity. Then we're going to use banks of inkjet um, heads to deliver uh, drops of ink to the reservoirs, and then we're going to let capillary forces pull that ink out spontaneously and deliver it to the device cavity. And what's nice about this is imprinting, we can print, uh, imprint one micron features, no problem. So we get around the resolution issue by using imprinting. We could never print with an inkjet printer a one micron line. So the other thing is that by putting in um, complex topography, as I'll show you, we actually get a self-aligning process where all we have to do is deliver the right ink to the right reservoir at the right time, and we can stack materials up on top of one another. So uh, here you see a reservoir and some imprinted capillary channels, and what's happened is that we've delivered a drop of ink, and capillary forces have immediately pulled the ink into the channels, and things go invisible because of refractive index matching. But then the, then the ink dries, and, and the point is that all we had to do is get the ink into this very easy-to-hit reservoir, and we could, we could get the ink into these um, narrower channels. So what would the scale process look like roll to roll? Well, the, step, the first step, step one, is imprinting. So we have a plastic, um, roll, a roll of plastic sheet, which we unwind, and then we coat a UV cross-linkable liquid onto this plastic. So UV cross-linkable means you shine light on this liquid and it solidifies. So we bring this wet uh, web, it's called, into contact with a stamp on a roll, and when the stamp is in contact with this liquid, it's molding it, it's, it's, it's making a shape, and that shape is fixed by UV light that's hitting the sample uh, right at that contact point. And so now we have a solidified, essentially micro-molded um, substrate that we can coil up over here. So that's the first step, imprinting. The second step is to, start, is to take that imprinted roll and now start delivering inks 
So again, metallic semiconducting and insulating inks, which we can dry using either blasts of light, using photonic sintering, or conventional ovens. All right? And that is what ultimately builds up the, builds up the devices. So we have um, a, a pilot scale line in Amundsen Hall just across Washington Avenue here. Um, this is the heart of the device. This is the wet web, so it's coated with the UV curable uh, liquid. It comes onto the roll, which has a stamp on it, and underneath here there's a slab illuminator that's uh, essentially solidifying or cross-linking the liquid, and so we're stripping off the patterned uh, material on the other side, okay? That's the imprinting line. And so if we, ha we have another line to do the inkjet, so if we have these pilot scale lines, now we have to really ask ourselves, can we really print circuits? And this is a very simple circuit, and an electrical engineer uh, might recognize what it is, but it doesn't matter. My point here is that there are transistors, there are resistors, there are capacitors, and those are the building blocks. And we have to be able to show that we can make all these kinds of building blocks before we can start to integrate and build systems. And that's, and that's what we've been working on. So this is where the engineering comes in, and I want to sort of guide you through this a little bit, um, sort of the nitty gritty of uh, how do we do this. The first thing you need for circuits is metal lines, right? They're also called interconnects. So how would we print you know, metal lines? These are copper metal lines printed by this scale process, roll to roll. Well, first we might imprint features that look like this, a reservoir and a, and a channel, and we deliver ink to the reservoirs. Capillarity draws the ink uh, into the channel, and when the ink dries, we now have a silver lining on this trench, right? Now we want a solid metal line, and the way we do this is by plating copper. So we immerse it in a copper plating solution, and we build up bulk copper, which is what gives you, which gives you these lines. And they have very low resistance, and so we can make metal lines. And this is just a few microns here, right? And the aspect ratio is about one to one, so we can make nice metal lines this way. How would we do resistors? Very simple um, electronic device, how do we make them? Well, we might, one design is, is, is here, print two reservoirs and a corral, deliver ink to the two reservoirs, capillarity draws the ink down, so these are our two silver electrodes, and now we drop conducting polymer uh, into this corral, which connects the two electrodes and gives us, gives us a resistor. All right? And we can make arrays of these, and we can vary the ohmage from one ohm to mega ohms, depending on what material we print here and the distance between the electrodes. We can make capacitors in a similar way. Here we're using a graphene ink and, and we use a, a gel electrolyte. So we have a, what's called an electrolytic capacitor. And those of you who maybe have electric, a little electrical engineering background, you recognize that you know, we can make an RC circuit. And this is entirely printed. And this is, this is a low, low pass filter. So this shows the output voltage of this device versus frequency. And this cutoff point here, um, we tune just by picking what R and C we make. So the big prize in this business is, is the transistor, which is the basic building block of, of circuits. It's the switching element. Um, and we have to do a very um, complex multi-level imprint, which I, I can't go into in detail, but here in blue, these shows, shows um, the plastic that's been imprinted. And um, so it's a four-level imprint. And we have reservoirs and channels that connect to these different levels. So we deliver ink number one, that connects to the base here, that gives us two middle electrodes, ink number two, and so on, ink number three, to build up uh, layer upon layer. And the devices work. Um, this is, those of you, some of you might recognize this as a, as a transfer characteristic for a transistor. It goes off to on and a volt. Um, so with these building blocks now, we can start to think about where are we going? What kind of systems do we want to make? It could be electronic um, e-skins for robots. It could be displays. It could be various kinds of health monitoring devices. Uh, that's where we're headed in the future. I'm very lucky to have some great graduate students and, and postdocs to work with and also some faculty colleagues, and I'd like to acknowledge them. In particular, uh, these students here, some of whom are, are in the room. And um, we received funding for this work from the Navy and the National Science Foundation, but also um, from a unique uh, industrial partnership program at, at the university called I'Prime. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention.